Uh, I'm blessed to be the executive pastor here, and we're excited that you're here with us today. Thanks for joining us uh, at Greenville First. And I have the honor and the privilege today of uh, being a part of opening a brand new series for us here at Greenville First. And uh, as Pastor Josh and I sat and we talked and uh, we were working through sermon series, when this series came up, there was a story that came to my mind. And, um, and, and I knew exactly where I needed to go on the first uh, week of this series. The series this week is called Baggage. And... Um, I've learned a lot about baggage over the years, and my wife and I, uh, we just uh, celebrated our anniversary, happy anniversary, but uh, uh, I'm blessed with the most amazing wife ever, love you. Uh, all right, now back to the message. Uh, so we love to travel, and um, being a, a, a pastor, Easter is huge for us, so we work, and we work, and we work, and we build up to Easter, so this year... I, I said, I'm going to need a break, so we planned a trip right after Easter. So Easter Sunday, we had service, and we're exhausted, and we're worn out, and that Monday, we go get on a plane, and we go take a trip, and we have a bucket list of uh, places we want to go, so I decided this year, uh, with the help of my wife and some friends, let's, let's knock one of those off the list, and let's go to Ireland. We got plane tickets for uh, super cheap. Let's go to Ireland and hang out and uh, see what that looks like for a week. So uh, we began to research, and I hate, I, I love going on trips. And I love uh, be, being and having a plan for our trip, but I don't like researching and planning the trip. So we left that to our friends to plan the trip. Uh, we took care of getting some plane tickets, and y'all planned the rest. Uh, so they booked hotels and what we were going to do. So the idea was we're going to tour all across Ireland for a week and just drive around and see the Cliffs of Mohar and the Ring of Kerry, and that's the only two I remember. But we had a great time. Uh, <laughs> I remember visually everywhere we went, I just don't remember the names of them, and we had a great time, but uh, there was a part of this trip, so uh, what, once research began to go and we would sit down and talk, we figured out that the roads there are pretty narrow, and since the roads are narrow, the cars are narrow, and uh, so they don't have big cars there, so we said, hey, we're going to have a small car, let's all pack light, uh, so uh, we decided, hey, we're going to pack a carry-on. Everybody's going to take a carry-on. It's great. We're going to pack light. We're going to have a great trip. So uh, that Monday comes, and we go to the airport. My wife and I drop her off. I park the car. I go back. We get our tickets. We have our carry-ons. We head to the gate. There we are. At the gate, our friends decide to arrive uh, a little bit before the plane's supposed to take off. Uh, if you know our friends, you know who that is and why that is. Uh, I love you wherever you are. Uh, but we're there, and they show up a few minutes before, and they've got their carry-ons, and we get on the plane, and we fly to Atlanta, we fly to Ireland, and there we are. And we get off the plane, and we go through immigration. We're ready to hit customs. No, we have to wait because they decided to check a bag. Uh, so remember, everything in Ireland's smaller. So uh, we're there at the carousel, and they have the conveyor belt that comes up, and everybody's standing around the conveyor belt, and they're waiting on their baggage, so we're standing there like good friends, being patient, trying to help them uh, figure out which bag is theirs when it comes off. And you knew when their bag came off the uh, carousel because the entire airport gasped. It was like an 18-wheeler just came over the conveyor belt and dropped on the carousel. And uh, it was the biggest bag you'd ever seen. So, so much for packing light, they have baggage. Uh, but it gets better. So now we're there and we have to go through customs. We go through customs and I think they had to pay a toll because their bag was so big. Uh, it was like a toll booth for large bags through Ireland. And uh, we go from there over to the, you have to walk all the way through the airport out over to the car rental place. So we go to the car rental place. And uh, we pull up, and there's all these seats. So there's, I don't know, 40 or 50 seats, and we, we show up. Now all of a sudden there's 10 because that bag takes up about 20 of them. And then uh, we're there, and we rent the car. Then you have to go down an elevator, and you have to walk all the way through this parking garage around, and they're dragging this bag all through. And then there's this little place you stop with 800 people waiting to get on uh, little transit vans that would take you to the car rental place. Uh, so now we're waiting, and it's our turn, and this 15-passenger van pulls up, and uh, we, we throw our little bags in the corner, and uh, uh, they got a forklift and lifted our friend's bag into the back of the van. Now the 15-passenger van holds three people, including the driver. We drive over, and we're there. They drop us off. They unload the giant bag, and we're standing there under this covered thing, and this lady walks up, calls our name, uh, follow me to your car. We go walk into our car. We've rented this small SUV. And we get there, and the lady's like, where did y'all go? 
oh, we're back here behind the bag. Uh, so we walk around, there's the car, uh, and the bag was legitimately bigger than the car. Uh, it would not go in the car at all. It wouldn't fit in the back of the car. Uh, definitely couldn't have got our luggage in, even if it would have fit. And then we thought about putting it on the top, but the car was just crushed. Uh, so uh, we had to rent this boat of a car. So now, if you know my friend, they have double vision, and they're the driver. And uh, so you have a narrow road with a wide car, and he's seeing twice of everything. Uh, it is not a good trip. I won't call anybody out Bullard. Um, <laughs> David Bullard. Uh, so there we are. It was Kim Bullard's bag, just by the way, uh, not David. David had a backpack. Kim had. Uh, so we're there, and we rent this car, and it's a boat. And, and every time we loaded the trunk, it was strategic. So David had it down how it had to load in the car, and it was great. And we had a wonderful trip. But when you think of baggage, that's where my mind goes. Automatically, I'm thinking of this large, heavy thing that we have to carry around that's a weight for us. And then we began to think through. So, so there's this baggage of this huge weight that we ha- carry around, and, and it has a negative connotation in, the, in our minds. And no doubt in life, we all have this baggage from our past that we carry, this baggage that someone has unloaded on us that we have to carry, baggage that we choose to pick up and carry on our own. But today I want to explore the thought of unclaimed baggage in our life, something of value for us that we haven't claimed for ourselves. Something that's there that we haven't claimed. So now, nowadays with airlines, unless you have like a gold card or a platinum card or a sapphire card, you have these cards uh, that gives you a free bag on your first, uh, first free bag on your flight. Almost every bag on almost every airline now costs something to put it on there. So if you're paying to ship this thing with you wherever it's going, it has some type of value to you. There's a value in that bag to you. So every city now that has a major airport have these stores, and they're called unclaimed baggage stores. So after 90 days, the airlines get rid of these bags that no one has claimed. Either they got lost and they never made it, or people like on our missions trips that we would take, and we would give them a tool bag or a prop bag to carry, and they would forget and leave it, Uh, those bags that we never see again. Uh, they find themselves to these unclaimed baggage stores where in the unclaimed baggage stores they'll unzip the bags and they pull all the valuables out and they trash all the junk and they'll wash all the clothes that are nice and they'll hang them on the racks for sale and the electronics and home goods and everything that's in the bag they begin uh, to sell uh, from that. So there's value in those bags. So I'm one of those guys, I like, I have to confess, I like reality TV shows even though I know most of them are scripted and and uh, completely made up for the most part. But there was a show I was watching for a while, and I finally quit watching it, and probably for good reason, but it was unclaimed baggage auctions. So these guys would show up, and they had on all this jewelry, and they looked like uh, they, they would drive, they show them driving up in their Mercedes and their, and their um, fancy cars, and they would come in, and they made it look like these guys were buying these unclaimed bags and getting rich off of it, and so you would watch this auction, and there's this bag that they couldn't open, uh, but they could look at it, and they could look and see the type of bag, or maybe they'll see a tag on it and see where it came, and then they would bid on the bag, and after they won the auction, they would open it up, and they were pulling out, like, gold cups and watches and computers and all this crazy stuff that nobody's going to put in a bag and check it. But, uh, so you know some of it's scripted. But the fact is, those bags had value in them. Even if it was scripted in the show, those bags have value. They had value to the owner, to the person that's looking at it. They can only look and see if, there, if, if they could tell there was value to it, but the owner knew that there was value to it. What was in the bag is a secret. They're all holding something inside. There's something valuable inside of the bag. And today, I want us to explore that thought for a few minutes of unclaimed baggage. What is it in our life that has value? What's available to us for our life that has value that we haven't taken possession of or that we've pushed aside and we've let it end up on this carousel for 90 days or 9 years or 20 years and we've left it there and we haven't seen or accepted or taken control of the value that is there and that's available for us. Let's pray real quick. Father, we love you. 
We thank you because you're good. And we thank you because we know that you're in this place. And Father, even as the song we just sang, dry bones come alive. Father, may there be dry parts of our life, of our soul that come alive today by your word, by your presence. And may we find ourselves at a crossroads where we need to make a decision. Father, today, a deeper and a stronger relationship with you, a step into faith with you today. And may we actively lean into what you're saying and hear what you're saying and may our lives be forever changed. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, the strong and mighty Son of God, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Colossians chapter 2. If you don't, it'll be on the screen in just a minute. And we're going to look at a couple of verses there to unpackage this idea of unclaimed baggage. You know, but, but here's the case. The entire world today is seeking for meaning and purpose. Everybody wants to, wants to have meaning and purpose for their life. They want to exist for something in life. And they want to discover the path that will lead them to that. What is it that leads us to that? And, and the truth is the church is no different. We may have different ways and that, that we try to figure that out, but the fact is we're all looking for something. We're looking for purpose in life, the path that we were created to live, whether that's how we voice it or speak it. That's what we're looking for, purpose and satisfaction in life. And today we're going to look at Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 1, and we're going to look at what that looks like for us. Verse 1 says this, Let me tell you how hard I have worked for you and the people in Laodicea and for all others who do not know me personally. I do this in order that they may be filled with courage and may be drawn together in love and so have the full wealth of assurance which true understanding brings. In this way, they will know God's secret, which is Christ himself. He is the key that opens all the hidden treasures of God's wisdom and knowledge. Since you have accepted Christ Jesus as Lord, live in union with him. Keep your roots deep in him, build your lives on him, and become stronger in your faith as you were taught, and be filled with thanksgiving. Sorry, I jumped to verse 6 on that. Some of you got lost there for a minute. I jumped to verse 6 on purpose. But I read that passage of Scripture, and I realize that, that that passage for me is encouraging when I read that, but it's also elusive. Because what does that really mean when we read that? And it says that Christ is the key to the secrets of God's knowledge and wisdom. And I read that and I, what does that really mean to me? Whether I'm a follower of Christ or I'm just somebody that hasn't decided to begin that faith walk with him yet, what does that mean to me? So we're in the book of Colossians, so here's Paul is writing to the Colossians who are a part of the Laodicean church. And if you jump all the way to the end of the Bible to Revelation, Jesus speaks to seven churches there in Revelation, and one of the churches is the Laodicean church, which the Colossians are a part of. And the Laodicean church was known as a wealthy church, and Jesus actually said to them, he said that, that you guys are rich, but I wish that you were poor. He said, you're lukewarm, you're neither hot, you're neither cold, I want to spit you from my mouth. And Jesus is, in his letter to them, he, this is what he's saying, he's saying, I, I, I'm fighting for you. I'm fighting for you, but you don't seem to have any interest in fighting for yourself. And then we jump into Colossians, and there's Paul talking to the Colossians, part of the Lo Laodicean church. And he's there, and that's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, I'm fighting for you. That's what he tells the Colossians. Everything I'm about to say to you is because I'm fighting for you. And as you sit in the room today, I want you to know this. Whether you're in the room, whether you're online, whether you're watching the video live now or later, I want you to know this. We exist. We're here because we're fighting for you. We're fighting for you. That's actually what we're doing. Some of you came in here today and you're, you're discouraged about life. Guess what? You have people that care enough that they're fighting for you. You came in here today and you don't feel the strength that you can try one more time. There are people that care enough that they're fighting for you. You came in here today and, and you feel like you'll always be broken and you'll never be made whole. I'm telling you, there's somebody that cares enough that they're fighting for you. Paul says that I'm fighting for you. If you look in verse 2 of Colossians 2, it says this, I do this in order 
that you may be filled with courage, and you may be drawn together in love, and so have the full wealth of assurance which true understanding brings. In this same way, they will know God's secret, which is Christ himself. The secret to the unclaimed baggage is Christ. It says it in the scriptures right there that it's Christ himself. Christ is the secret. He's the strength to all we need. He's the hope to all that we need. He's the healing to all that we need. Jesus Christ himself is that secret for us. If we came in today hopeless and helpless and wounded and broken and lost and desperate and insecure and depressed, guess what? The answer for you today is found in Colossians 2, which is Christ himself. Christ is the key to the life that you want to live as well as the life that you were created to live. Colossians 2, 2 also says this, in the same way he will know the secret, which is Christ himself. But then it goes on in verse 3 to say, he is the key that opens the hidden treasures of God's wisdom and knowledge. What does that mean? He is the key that opens the hidden treasures of God's wisdom and knowledge. I think for us, we have to understand that Christ is the key to our future, or Christ is the key to your future. I love keys. If you go to my house, there's a, there's a desk right next, a little desk area next to our kitchen, and if you open the top right drawer, somehow it's become a junk drawer full of pens and tape and scissors that are like childproof scissors that won't cut butter. Um, I tried to use them the other day for something, and they wouldn't do it. And Mary Lou's like, sir, do you want real scissors? Uh, I was in the office and found a pair, and she's like, sir, do you want real scissors? Please, uh, these don't work. Uh, but also in that drawer are keys. If you go into my bedroom and in my nightstand, if you open the top drawer, there's a bowl in there that has keys. If you go into my garage, there's a... Uh, toolbox there and if you pull out the top drawer of the toolbox there are keys if you go in my truck and you open the door in the door handle there's keys if you open the console in the middle there's keys if you go in my desk in my office and you open the top drawer there's nine million tootsie rolls that all the staff kids come and eat and a hundred million keys I love keys now I can't tell you I know where all of them go and what they all work for but I have keys everywhere why do I love keys I love keys because they open the places that I want to go. Keys will unlock to realms, dimensions, to rooms, to objects of things that I want or places that I want to go. And the Bible tells us that Christ himself is the key to the hidden treasures of God. If God were to offer you a key that would open everything that he has for you, what would you do with that key? Would you lose the key? Would you forget about the key? We all have those keys that we forget what they even go to. I have them. I don't know what they go to, but I know they go to something important, so I kept them. Uh, And every now and again, uh, I will find a key that I needed for something. Most of the time, I can't. But the fact is, we have those keys, and sometimes we have doors and locks that we need to get into, but yet we've forgotten the key to open the door that we want to go through. And all of us have this journey of trying to access the fullness of life. We're trying to find the secret to happiness and to health and to wealth, and we pay all this money for books, and we pay all this money for seminars so that we can be a better you, and a new you, and a healthy you, and a wealthy you. And we pay all this money for that when the Bible tells us there's a secret that's free for us. It didn't cost us, it cost, everything costs something. It cost Christ his life. It cost God his son, but it's free to us to receive this key. We spend money on the books and the seminars, yet there's a free secret for us. Christ himself is a secret. Have you ever had someone that come up to you and ask you, hey, do you want to hear a secret? I'll tell you, but you can't tell anyone. But here's what you know. You can tell somebody because somebody told them it was a secret, and they're telling you, so they're not keeping to the secret that they got. So they're telling you, so you know you can go tell anybody because what are they going to say to you? Because it was a secret. But we have these secrets in our lives that we're not supposed to tell anybody. 
But here's the fact. Once we step into faith, we have a secret that we should share. There should be a secret that we're willing to share, that Christ is the answer to our hope. Christ is the answer to our desperation. Christ is the answer to our depression. Christ is the answer to our broken life, to our unhappy life, that Christ is the answer and we should have that. There's this unclaimed baggage that sits over in the corner on the carousel going around and around and around that we choose not to take the value and share with someone else. So I love the outdoors. So one of my favorite stores in town happens to be Cabela's. Um, I just go in just so I can smell it when you walk in the front door. There is a smell. Uh, I have asked them, hey, what air fresheners do you guys use? And they won't tell me. Um, so now every time I go into a store and they have candles, my wife hates candles. But I love candles with smell. So I go in and I open every candle and I smell to see if it smells like Cabela's. And I've found like eight that I think do. Uh, so they're all in the cabinet in my office, and I light them. And then Mary Lou's like, sir, I got a headache. Can you blow that out? And I'm like, yes, ma'am. Um, but so I have like eight candles in there, babe. I, I went to TJ Maxx the other day, and I spent like 60 bucks on candles. I'm just confessing right now. Uh, but Cabela's is that store that I walk into, and I could buy endless amounts of things because I love everything that's in there but every now and again you just find a super deal so I found like this backpack in there a couple years ago it was a browning backpack and I love it I carry it everywhere I go I carry it every day it keeps my computer it keeps everything and I don't know why I like it I just like it but it was like a $70 backpack and it was in then they had the bargain cave till Bass Pro bought it and I'm not angry about Bass Pro ruining Cabela's or anything but now it doesn't have a bargain cave in the store but then it did the backpack was like 70 bucks and it was marked down and marked down and marked down and and, and I, I took it to the register thinking it was going to be like 20 bucks and I can't remember I paid like 12 or 13 dollars for this backpack that has lasted forever and I love but I couldn't keep that a secret so I came home and I was telling Kayla our daughter our 23 year old she liked my backpack this is where I got it this is how much it was and she went up there and there wasn't anymore um they were all gone by then. Uh, but when, when we find something of value and worth that we can't believe, wow, look what I got, look what I found, look what was given to me, then we want to share that. But yet we find the secret to Christ and sometimes we just tuck it away. We're so excited to share about a backpack or about an item that we found, or this candle that smells like this, or this supermarket has this amazing sale, or the loft has a sale that's like 98% off. Come buy it now, but it costs $10 million to buy it in the first place, so it's still overpriced. But it's there. Sorry, my wife shops at loft. Uh, still venting up here about some things, working through some issues. Um, but then we tuck things aside, and we don't share. Today, I need you to hear me. If you're here today and you're searching for, for, for fulfillment, if you're here today and you're searching for hope, if you're here today and you're searching for answers, if you're here today and you're searching for purpose, you're searching for freedom, the answer to all of that and more is Christ. He's the key that's unlocked all the doors of goodness and generosity in my life. Everything God wants to do in us, he wants to do with us. God isn't a God that we step into faith and then all of a sudden everything is peaches and cream and, and that, he, that uh, he just wants to pour and pour and pour into us and, and that's his work. He wants to do great things in us. He wants to do great things for us, but he wants to do it with us. When my wife and I got married, we stood together before a pastor and and we said our vows, and we said I do, and he said you can kiss your bride, and I kissed my bride, and everything was magical, and everything's been great since. We've never had one fight. Uh, hang on, let me repent real quick uh, at the altar. But the fact is, if that would have been the end, if, if that was the beginning of our relationship and we never did anything else to develop the relationship, if that was it, we, we said, I do. He said, kiss your bride. I now pronounce you husband and wife. And that was the end of it. It wouldn't be much of a marriage. Marriage is about us together. 
And a relationship with Jesus isn't just about him giving you everything. It isn't just about him fixing you. It isn't just about him providing for you. It isn't about him helping you. It's about a relationship together. It's not a one-sided street. He wants to do it with us. How does that key unlock in us? If Christ is the key to our future, how does that key unlock in us? If you jump to verse 6, he gives us some basic guidelines for this process. Since you have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord. Now listen, I realize not everybody has stepped into faith with Christ. Not everybody has crossed that line of faith and said, yes, be, be Lord of my life. And probably not everybody in this room has done that. But even as we read this, this would be for those of us who have said, yes, I want you to be Lord of my life, forgive me of my sins. But then it's also for those who haven't yet, but will have that opportunity to do so. It says, since you've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, live in union with him. Live in union with him. What does that mean? Live in union with him. To live in union whether it's a husband and a wife or whether it's Christ and ourselves, to live in union is a relationship. It means that we both have active parts of growing closer with one another, of pouring into one another, of developing a relationship. So for us, relationship must become reality. With Christ, relationship must become reality. For those of us who've crossed that line of faith and we've opened our lives to Jesus and we live in union with Him, then it's about us developing a relationship with Him. If you've asked Christ into your life, He meets you with grace. It's a complete act of grace. It's a complete act of grace with Him, but it has to go beyond that. If you accept Him and you've decided to live with Him, but yet your relationship never develops further than, God, forgive me of my sins, then something's wrong. Because we're created to have that relationship with Him, to have that union with Him. God wants us to live so deeply in a relationship with Him that it becomes the reality of our life. He tells us the way to develop this relationship in the second part of that verse. In verse well, in verse 7, he says, keep your Roots deep in him, build your lives on him. And I love this verse because I love the imagery of this verse. It's the imagery of a tree or of a plant, a flower, a vine, something that has root systems. So if you go out west, there's these huge redwood trees and they're super tall and they're humongously wide. But those trees could never get that big. The, the core, the inside of that tree could never grow and be that healthy if it didn't have a deep root system. Thus is our relationship with Christ. We can have this shallow relationship of, with Christ, and every time the wind blows, we topple over. And we have to be set back up, and we have to be put back up, and we have to walk back to this thing of grace again and say, hey, God, I'm, I'm back here, and now I want to develop this relationship, but yet we continue to do the same thing. We have to have this root system. And think about this. There's flowers and fruit trees. For a fruit tree to bear fruit, it has to have a root system that's pulling nutrients from the soil to feed the tree to create the fruit. Or for a plant, uh, for a vine to create a grape, or a, uh, it, it has to pull nutrients from the ground to feed the vine, to feed the plant. For a tree to have leaves or to have acorns, it's a process. The imagery is amazing for me, and I look at that in our lives with Christ. When you're rooted in Jesus, you begin to have the fruit of Jesus in your life. When you carry inside of you bitterness and jealousy and greed and arrogance and, and when you walk around with anger and un, unforgiveness, you don't have the fruit of Christ in your life. But when you're walking around and you're rooted in Jesus, different fruits begin to emerge. Uh, forgiveness and kindness and gentleness and compassion and integrity and honesty rises from your life because you're rooted in Him and you're pulling nutrients from His Word and from your relationship with Him changes the fruit in your life. Verse 7 goes on to say, and become stronger in your faith as you were taught. Your foundation is the core of your future. Your foundation is the core of your future. He's, he's not, he says not only keep your roots deep, but also build your life on him. He changes the metaphor a little bit there from, from a root system to building your life on him. 
what he's telling us is that Jesus needs to be the foundation of our life. When Jesus enters our life, he becomes the foundation. He becomes what our life is built on from that moment on. Now, I've stepped into faith with Christ, and, and there's no longer a, just a Jimmy Sellers anymore. There's no two me's. There's not a, a, a Jimmy Sellers here, and then on Sundays, a Jimmy Sellers with Jesus. When I build a foundation in my life on Christ, when he becomes the core of my life, then, then there's no story of Jimmy outside of Jesus. Everything's with Jesus. So, so it's not Jimmy on Sunday morning in church, Jimmy with Jesus on Sunday morning in church, and then Jimmy at home with family on Monday, or Jimmy at work, or Jimmy in the office, or Jimmy at the ballpark, or Jimmy anywhere else. It's Jimmy at work with Jesus. It's Jimmy at home with Jesus. It's Jimmy at the ballpark with Jesus because he becomes the core of who we are. It says become stronger in your faith. That's an important description for us. You're supposed to become stronger in your faith. That means that if your faith is the same now as it was when you started, then something's wrong. You know, I'm in a stage of life now that um, I have to think about my health a little more. Um, the older I get, my body has a mind of its own. And I tell my body, I talk to it sometimes, and say, you're going to be in shape. And my body talks back and says, I am a shape. I'm round uh, at times. <laughs> so, so we have arguments, and I've learned the older I get, I have to try to slow down gravity when it comes to my body. And uh, so now I try to watch the amount of calories I eat, and I count the carbs that I eat because, you know, I, I have five kids, and I want to be able to play with my kids, and our oldest daughter is... Um, getting married in September, so in five or six years, Kayla, if you're watching, five or six years when you have grandkids, uh, you have kids and we have grandkids, we don't need them sooner than that. Uh, I want to be able to play with my grandkids, so I want to be in shape, so uh, I think Dennis is somewhere. Dennis, I went to the gym a few times with Dennis, and uh, he got frustrated and never would go back with me. Um, told me I was a whiner or a complainer or something, I don't know what it was, but... Uh, it, you know, Dennis will try to tell you, and trainers probably try to tell you. I wouldn't know because I don't go to trainers because they push me too hard um, when it comes to that. But uh, trainers will tell you you have to build the inside. You know, when swimsuit season comes in the end of March, into May, April, May, everybody wants to look good to go in their swimsuit. And so, so they go on diets and they walk on the treadmill like five minutes a day, one day a week, and, and they're, trying to, they're, they're trying to look better for swimsuit season. And um, they're trying to make the outside look great. So they look good in their swimsuit. But the fact is that if you're like me and you're probably carrying a few too many pounds than you're supposed to, you have to work on the outside and the inside. There's a core inside. So if you want abs... You can't just count carbs and get abs. Now, the other day, I don't know if I was laughing, I was doing something, and I had my hand there, and I felt an ab. Uh, <laughs> this is a true story. So I reached over, and I grabbed Dina's hand. I said, look, I have one. It's right there. <laughs> and I, I, don't, I don't know if I was laughing. I was doing something, and I felt it. So I, had to, uh, I was excited about that. And, but the fact is, you, you can watch your carbs and... You can count your calories, but you'll never develop abs if you don't work on the core, the inside. You have to do it from inside and out. And the fact is, for a lot of us, here's the truth. Our core strength's on the inside, and then there's the outside. Most of us don't care about being stronger. We just care about looking better. Mm. Most of us don't care about being stronger. We just care about looking better. So we might want to step in to faith with Jesus because we want life to be better but we don't really care about being stronger in our faith and living the life that we're meant to live but then if you look at the end of that verse he says be filled with thanksgiving what's interesting there for me is what does that mean he wraps all that up by saying Live in me and have union with me and grow in your relationship with me and make sure you're filled with thanksgiving. I told you, parts of this is elusive and I'm trying to figure it out. So 
the only thing that I can even see that he would say that for is because we leak. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a leaker. Now look at your second choice, your other neighbor, and say, you're a leaker. The fact is, we leak. You have holes in your soul, and you leak. You ever have one of these moments, maybe you come in church, or maybe you're at home and you're in the Word, or maybe uh, you're worshiping in your car and you're like, Jesus, I love you and I'll follow you anywhere. Then an hour later, you're like, oh, never going to make it today. You know why you did that? Because you leak. Maybe you're there and, you know, nothing can ever stop me. Everything's holding me back. Why? Because we leak. Some of you today, you're going to listen, or Zach's going to get back up here in the band, and they're going to lead us in some songs, and we're going to leave so inspired today that it lasts five minutes. Because you're a bad leaker. (laughs) You got some big holes. The only thing that plugs up those holes in your soul is gratitude thankfulness. We begin to fill our lives with thankfulness and gratitude for what God's done and what others have done in our lives. It begins to fill and to seal the holes in our soul that leak. When you're an ungrateful person, no matter how much faith, no matter how much hope, how much love someone pours into you, you just leak. You leak because of a lack of Gratitude in your life, which just expands the holes. But when you're grateful and everything that God puts in stays in and everything that others puts in stays in, all the good you receive actually become a part of who you are. Gratitude lines your souls and plugs the holes so that we can do as Christ wants us to do and as Paul tells us to do in Colossians, to be filled with thanksgiving. So today, you may be in this room and you look and you say, hey, I'm, I'm at a crossroads in my life because I'm seeking for purpose and I'm seeking for direction and I'm seeking for meaning out of life, but I've never accepted Christ in our lives. And we look in Colossians chapter 2 and it says Christ is the secret. He's the key. Christ himself is the key that unlocks your future for you. It unlocks hope for you. It unlocks peace for you. It unlocks your future for you. So today you may be that person that sits in this room and says, hey, I need to step into faith. For the rest of us in the room, maybe we're challenged by this. That, that, hey, we've stepped into faith with Christ, but we really haven't rooted ourselves in Him. We haven't seen Him and made Him the core of our life and built our life on Him and Him alone. Maybe we've stepped into faith with Him, but we've left Him on the baggage carousel of life, unclaimed baggage in our life that we haven't really tapped in to the relationship and the life that He offers us. And there's another aspect to that that challenges me in the fact that I have the key to the secret for someone else. And maybe that isn't, hasn't been the heart of my life, that I have the answer and the hope for those that God places in my path. That's why I love Saturday. We're just going to serve our community, serve day. If you haven't signed up for serve day, take advantage of that. Go on our app, see the projects that are there, and say, hey, I'm willing to serve, whether it's cooking a meal for families at the Ronald McDonald House because they have a kid in the hospital. And we get to bring a little hope and happiness into their life for a few moments with a meal as we prepare and then just fellowship with them while they eat. Maybe you just want to bless someone that can't do it themselves, an elderly lady or family in our church and there's projects that we're going to work on yards and there's projects where we're going to bless schools in our community nothing for us but just share a little key of hope for somebody that may need it that's why I love growth track I'm 
I'm going to walk out in the hallway and love on people for a minute and make my way to a room and talk to people about our church and help them understand who our church is this week and next week help them discover their design. How did God create us? What gifts did he give us? Then the next week talk about leadership and, and here's the fact, it's not just leadership in church. The principles that, that we share in Growth Track for leadership you can plug into your business, you can plug into your school, you can plug in because they're principles that came from God for our lives. And then week four make a difference. Why? Because we have a key that we want to share. So wherever you fit today, you're at a crossroads where you're faced with a decision of, God, this is what you've spoken into my life. Now what will I do with it? In a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to worship and we're going to sing a song. And In that moment, you'll have a choice. You, you can respond or you can respond in your seat or you can respond by coming forward. But we're just going to take a minute and do that and you can respond to God yourself. But today, maybe you're that person in this room and you said, hey, you hit the nail on the head with me. I came in thinking I'm so broken and I'll never be whole. I'm so lost in life and I'm seeking for purpose. I live in depression and I've tried everything and you talked about this key that would help deliver me from that and today, I want to try that. We're going to give you that opportunity. Every head bowed and every eye closed for a moment. If you're in this room today and you say, hey, I've never stepped into a relationship with Jesus Christ. I've never leaned in. Listen to what he wanted to say to me and responded to that by accepting him into my life. If that's you today and you say, I want to step into faith today, would you raise your hand right where you are today? Thank you, guys. Anybody else? Anybody else today? Anybody else? You want to step into a relationship with Jesus Christ. We're just going to pray for you. Go ahead. Would everybody pray this prayer with me out loud today with those that raise their hands? Dear Jesus, thank you for this opportunity to begin my faith walk with you. Please forgive me of my mistakes in my life. Today as I begin to build this relationship with you, May I find the answers and the hope that I need in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.